Uh, we've been conducting a long-term uh, research project looking at the consequences of inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity in isolated populations of threatened species, mostly bird species, here in New Zealand, work in conjunction with the Department of Conservation. Um, one of the key species we've been looking at is robin populations, and they're a nice species to address this question about loss of genetic diversity because they not only occur on the mainland, but they also occur on offshore islands. Dunedin was a population we were interested in because here was a mainland population, but was very isolated, was very small, and therefore had this possibility of having uh, much reduced genetic diversity. We uh, found out that the Animal Health Board was planning to do a 1080 drop in the Silver Peaks. That's where one of our source populations were. The other one was in the Silver Stream, which, is, uh, which wasn't scheduled to have any 1080 uh, operation there. Robins um, had sometimes had died as a result of the 1080 drop, like actually eating the bait or secondary poisoning. And of course, to be honest, I, I was a bit concerned about that. I mean, here we have a, a, a robin population that we were studying. We wanted to do some long-term studies on them. And, you know, realistically, I was worried that a, a potential 1080 drop was going to have an immediate impact on that population. A recent paper by Veltman and Westbrook had pointed out that some of the uh, operations for 1080 had changed from moving from carrot bait to cereal baits, and that uh, pre-feeding was another issue. And, and there's basically a real lack of studies since these new modifications in the use of 1080 baits have been done on marked populations of birds. In the past, often people use, uh, for example, five-minute bird counts. And there's all kinds of uh, problems with five-minute bird counts. They're not very accurate in giving you good estimates of survival. The best way to get um, really robust estimates of survival is with a marked population, so when the birds have, have bands and you can individually identify them. I recognized immediately that this uh, could be quite an interesting study because uh, we had uh, a marked population of robins already there that we had been monitoring. My uh, student, uh, Robert, Robert Shadowinkle, already knew where all the territories were. We had them all mapped. We had all, most of the birds marked, and we just had to mark a few more. The idea was to go in and do two surveys uh, before, immediately before the 1080 drop so that we could count how many birds were there and we'd note where they are and then to do two surveys immediately after the 1080 drop. And to do the same thing over in Silver Stream, so this is up in Silver Peaks where the 1080 operation was going to occur, and then to also do this in Silver Stream where we were also doing long-term monitoring but there wasn't going to be a 1080 drop. Now at the same time, uh, Robert and I decided that it would be ideal to also get some idea of how many predators were in the area both before and after the 1080 drop. So we wanted to make sure that the idea, of course, is the 1080 was going to kill the possums. The real question we had in mind was, well, what was going to be the impact on the rats? Because rats have this amazing potential to um, reproduce and build up in numbers quite quickly. So even though you might have a short-term effect of the, of the uh, rat population being knocked back, it might not be long-lasting or might not be long-lived. And so by the time the robins were in their peak breeding, because uh, the drop was going to happen in around August, by the time they get to their peak breeding and nesting in November, it's, it's possible the rats could have uh, come back and had some devastating effect. So that was the whole idea of doing some monitoring of the rats and the possums before and after, using chew cards through our, our robin area and being able to see what the impact of that was. So here we were sitting in a situation where we could potentially answer some of these important questions that others had raised in the literature. We didn't have any, any invested interest in how it all turned out, except that I didn't want any rob our long-term robins necessarily to die from the, the 1080. We approached the uh, Animal Health Board uh, saying we had this, uh, I guess, this proposal, and, and um, they were happy to, to, uh, to give us uh, some fundings to cover some of our costs, but to more or less work uh, independently uh, to be able to carry out this study. Robert had to do all the leg work and the, and the hard work of getting out there in the field 
uh, doing the doing the surveys before and after the the, the drop, and also doing the the chew card surveys, which were sort of done at the same time to look at that impact of the predators. And the third component of this study was then to go out and see after the 1080 drop whether there was any effect on nesting success because of course if the predators like rats have been reduced we might expect uh, nesting success in the silver peaks to increase from perhaps what it has been in the past uh, relative to, say to a place like silver stream where there wasn't any 1080 operation so this is going to show the possum numbers in the uh, silver peaks, which is the gray, light gray, and then the darker gray is the silver stream population. That's the treatment, 1080 treatment, and the non-treatment area. So what we can certainly see is that the numbers have declined uh, significantly in the silver peaks for the possums. 80 days later, they were still low, and when we contrast that to the silver stream where there was no operation, of course, it goes up and down. We get a pretty similar picture with the rats, hey, because they the numbers weren't all that high compared to the silver stream before the uh, 1080 drop. But nevertheless, they your chew cars you you didn't get any you didn't detect any no, did you? No, no, no post detected. operation. But again, there's a little bit of an error around that. But certainly a significant drop in rats. But quite importantly, uh, those numbers remain low even 80 days later and of course we got pretty high um, rat numbers there in Silver Stream. This all coincides quite um, readily with what we found out with the nesting or what you found out with the nesting success because we found whereas in the Silver Stream you know you had very poor nesting success lots of nest failures I think we only had one nesting one, only one confirmed. Yeah, one confirmed fledgling, fledgling that, that happened. Uh, in the Silver Peaks, of course, we had uh, very high nesting success, 60-70% um, uh, survival there for the, for the nests. So, of course, at the same time you've done these um, uh, the predator surveys, you were doing the, well, not at the same time, but the next, next few days you did the robin surveys as well. And what we had about um, in the Silver Peaks area, you had 19 bandit robins and five unbanded ones on, on various territories. And of course, after the ten, immediate after the 1080 drop, drop, when you did those surveys, all you recited all 19 of them, or subsequently recited all 19 of them. So none of them died. We need to see what really happens next year in terms of the survival of the robins in the two sites. So that's your survival rate, and uh, that is balanced by recruitment rates, how many juveniles end up coming through. So you get those, those two things will, will, will any, end up affecting your population growth and ultimately population persistence in those areas.